Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. So welcome, good to have you all with us, those watching on YouTube or listening on audio or those watching on our mobile phones online, it's great to have you with us and it's always good to gather, always good to gather. And I was here, we, you know, in, in Australia we still have freedom to gather and freedom to worship the Lord. And if you have that same freedom in whatever nation you're in, then praise God, that's a real privilege because some places and some nations no longer have that freedom. And so we need to appreciate that we have freedom in this country to gather and to worship openly and and just bless the Lord. You know, he's given us our breath. He's given us our our food, our, our air. He's just so wonderful. He's such a giving and loving father. So hallelujah. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called draw near to God. Draw near to God. And you know, before we were saved, we were spiritually lost, spiritually blind and spiritually naked. And we were headed for an eternity in hell. However, you know, it is the goodness of God that he sought us out. And now we can draw near to God. If we turn to Psalm 40, reading from the King James Bible here, Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2. And it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. I'm sure those that are saved have that same testimony. And the Amplified says, I waited patiently and expectantly for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me out of a horrible pit, a pit of tumult and of destruction, out of the miry clay, froth and slime, and set my feet upon a rock, steadying my steps, and established my goings. I mean, that's such a testimony. And those that are saved have that testimony. We were in darkness. We were stumbling around in the dark. And yet God rescued us and put our lives on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, and established our steps. Hallelujah. And let's turn to Romans chapter 2, verse 4. And we read here. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You know, God is love and love is patient. And repentance means to be remorseful of sin and to have a change of mind. You know, our life was going that direction and then we realized our life was so fell, so fell short of the glory of God. We repented, we turned our ways and we start walking God's ways. And it's a change of mind and we no longer want to do sin, but we want to go God's way and God's way is a way of holiness. So getting saved was God's idea. I'm just going to read that verse from the Amplified. It says, or are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth of his kindness and forbearance and long-suffering patience? Are you unmindful or actually ignorant of the fact that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repent, to change your mind and inner man to accept God's will? All right, so a change takes place. When there's genuine repentance, a change takes place. And even so, being saved and drawing near to God causes a change. It changes, our lives get changed. And some people don't like change. But in God, change in God is always for the better. Even though we don't understand all things and why things may happen sometimes, our lives are secure and safe in God. And his plan is, his future, it's for us, is secure. He has a plan for us. And so never be concerned about change because our lives are in God and he knows exactly what he's doing in our lives and it's for his glory. 
And also these changes that we go through, they're not a one-time event just when we got saved. No, it's, um, it's an ongoing occurrence as we walk, as our walk deepens in the Lord. All right, there's going to be change. And, you know, we are being changed from glory to glory. We become increasingly more like the Lord. And so his life should be, be coming forth more and more. Amen. Let's turn to Psalm 73 and read what the psalmist says here. Psalm 73, verse 22, verses 22 to 28, it says, So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by thy right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Can you hear his heart? It's so beautiful. Verse 26. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. It's a powerful verse, 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now I'd like to just to, to consider a few examples of people who drew near to God. And first I'd like to look at Moses. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. And it reads, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. So Moses was going about his regular day looking after the sheep and he's in a desert place. It's pretty dry. And we understand from this passage that when Moses saw the bush burning and yet it wasn't being consumed, that really got his attention and he turned aside to look at this great sight. So he was going in a certain way, but he turned. It really got his attention. And verse 4, it says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. You know, the Lord responded because Moses turned to the Lord. God's waiting for us to turn to him so that he can respond as well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verses 5 and 6, and it says, And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereupon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the Lord God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look on God. I'll just quote it. It's uh, Hebrews 12, 14. It says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man can see the Lord. And the Amplified says, Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. So holy, God is holy. You know, we read in, in Revelation, they say, Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord. And that's who he is. And he's the head and he expects that same from his body. But, you know, Moses, he saw the burning bush. He heard the voice of God. And what did the Lord say? Take your shoes off your feet. And feet speak of our walk. And Moses' life was about to change for the better. 
and the ground he now stood on was holy ground. All right, no matter what our background is, no matter what our life was before we come to the Lord, when we turn to God, his expectation for us is to walk in the ways of holiness. Hallelujah. It's for his glory. You know, and Moses, he was afraid to look on the Lord. It wasn't, um, it was a reverential fear. I mean, here's the voice of God speaking to him. There's bushes burning. He had an encounter and he had a reverential fear of the Lord. And God's church needs to have a reverential fear of the Lord for who God is. And he is holy. And when it gets further down, judgment's going to start beginning in the house of God. And what God once winked at, he's not going to wink at anymore. And there is judgment coming first to the house of God. And he's going to judge his house first before he judges the world. So he's just going to uh, bring adjustment to people's lives. And, and we want him to adjust our lives. Amen. Yes, we do. And so Moses' life changed that very day because he had an encounter with the Lord. And we need encounters with the Lord, not just when we first get saved, but ongoing encounters with the Lord. You know, not just a, oh, I remember way back then. No, God wants us to have experience after experience with him. Hallelujah. I was just thinking like a marriage, when a couple get married, you know, that's wonderful on the wedding day. But life isn't just the wedding day. God wants husbands and wives are to have encounters with each other all through their married life. And it's not just a one-time experience on their wedding day, but their relationship should be getting stronger and the bond more strong in God. Hallelujah. And, uh, and experiencing a more wonderful wedding bliss as they mature in, in life and in God. Hallelujah. The next example I'd like to look at is regarding a woman with an issue of blood. And it's found in Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 48. I'll just read it. It says, And there was a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians. Neither could be healed of any. She came behind him, Jesus, and touched the border of his Jesus' garment. And immediately her issue of blood stanched. It means it stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When, he, when all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee. And thou sayest, who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody has touched me. For I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And the, when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. You know, how long had that woman been in that condition? Twelve years. And how much money had she spent on the doctors, the physicians? All her money. So now she was really desperate. And clearly she'd heard of Jesus, otherwise she would not have wanted to draw near to him. And under the law, a woman with an issue of blood was not allowed to be out in the public. And so she was so desperate and she made herself of no reputation. She didn't care what anybody thought about her or what the consequences were going to be. She was so desperate to press in. And, she, you know, she just knew in her heart, if I can only just get to Jesus, if I can just touch him, I know I'll be healed. And she just, she just had that in her heart that her whole situation would change if she could just touch him. And Jesus was moved by her touch of faith. She literally did touch the hem of his garment, but she touched him in faith because virtue flowed from him. And it was faith in Jesus that caused the issue of blood to stop. Hallelujah. And, you know, we need to be desperate like that woman. You know, she drew near to Jesus as well as touched him in faith. You know, some people might be around Jesus, right? And he had lots of people thronging him that day. But she pressed through and she touched him. And so there's a difference. Just you, We can be around the things of God, but we need to press in and touch him. And it's a touch of faith. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. And touch him in faith for whatever our situation may be. It might be a healing or it may be a physical thing or a financial situation or a, a relationship situation. But the key is to press in, draw near to God and touch him. Hallelujah. And I just want to look at uh, Abraham and Isaac. If we just turn back to Genesis chapter 15. Fifteen verses 1 to 5 and it says and after these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying fear not Abram I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward and Abram said Lord God what will you give me seeing I go childless and this steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus and Abram said behold to me thou hast given me no seed and lo one born in my house is mine heir and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that come forth, he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. What a great promise. You know, you look up into the sky at night and you see the galaxy of stars. It's just amazing. And here he was giving Abraham a vision of what was going to happen. Yes, he was going to be given seed as the dust of the earth, but he was going to see stars. And, you know, and it was actually during the daytime. So he actually couldn't see the stars, but he could see them by faith. And of course, at nighttime, he could see the stars. So every time he would go out at nighttime, it would be a constant reminder that God had promised to give him seed. And, and God did promise Abraham and Sarah that they would have a son, an heir. And however, as Abraham and Sarah were really old, it was impossible for them to have a child. Let's turn over to chapter 17, verses uh, 15 to 21. And it says, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, which shall her name be. And I will bless her, and I will bless her. And give her a son also of her. And yea, I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make of him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And God told them the name of the child was to be Isaac. And Isaac means laughter. So in their old years, Isaac was to be born and they were going to have such joy. It was going to be an absolute miracle birth. And it's not over till it's over. So some people go through situations and they think, is it ever going to come to pass? Is it ever going to happen? Well, God promised Abraham and he's a man who cannot lie. God cannot lie. And what he says he will do, he will do. Amen. So then we also read what the Lord said to Abraham. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 18, verse 10. 14. And the Lord said, and I, and I said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of thy life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now this is the second time. God's, God just doesn't give it to him once. He re reaffirms it and confirms. Now Abram and Sarah were old and well stricken in age and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself saying after I am waxed old shall I have pleasure my Lord being old also. And the Lord said unto Abraham wherefore did Sarah laugh saying shall I have a surety bear a child which am old. Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Hallelujah. At the time, the appointed time, Sarah 
is going to have a son. And I'll just say it because it's coming to me right now. You know, the woman, God is preparing a woman, his church, the, and perfecting her, bringing her up to spiritual maturity. And she's going to bring forth a son. They call it man-child in Revelation, but it's multiplicity. And God is preparing a woman and she's going to bring forth sons of God. And it's going to be, you know, though it tarry, wait for it because it's going to come to pass because God has said it. And so we need to be in that woman group. We need to be a part of that perfected church, a part of that bride, because what God has said is going to come to pass. And he's looking throughout all the earth for hearts, for people that want to be a part of his vision. We're not after any man's vision or any organization's vision. We're after God's vision. And God has written his vision in the book and he's written it he said make it plain that people can read and run with it on tables of heart and God has put his word into our hearts so that we can hear his word run with his word believe his word keep his word obey his word and measure up to all that God's got planned and God did the choosing God chose each one of us each one who can hear what I'm saying or see what I'm saying, God has chosen us, brought us out of the miry clay, put our feet on the rock because his callings are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind about, oh, no, I've changed my mind. I don't want you now. No, God's called us, chosen us for such a time as this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me go back to Abraham and Sarah. And uh, so Abraham and Sarah had God's word on the situation and God being true to his word, Sarah did conceive a child whom they called Isaac, which means laughter. And God has given us his word so we can, we too can rest assuredly regarding our situation. You know, if we're not sure what to do, we need to go to God and open his word, draw near to God because he wants to lead and guide us and show us what he'd have us to do, especially if we're having to make decisions. Lord, shall I take this job? Shall I go to this place? Shall I do this? The Lord wants to show us. It says in all our ways, commit our way to him and our thoughts will be established. You know, trust the Lord with all our heart, lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledge him. When we bring him in on the decision making, he will order our steps. Hallelujah. So with Isaac, all the future, all that God promised was in Isaac. And after all, he was a miracle child. He was the promised seed. However, the Lord tested Abraham and asked him to offer Isaac. You know, and there are tests that come to each life. And what are we going to do? Will we pass the test? What's going to happen? Let's turn to Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt, let's test Abraham, and said at him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. You know, Ishmael didn't even have that same rating because Isaac was the child of promise. Take your son, your only son, get thee to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of God, which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young men, abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad, will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So Abraham must have said that in faith because that he and Isaac would return because the offering of Isaac, that meant Isaac was going to be offered as a burnt offering with the fire, with the wood, and that he would just be turned into ashes. And here's Abraham saying, the lad and I are going to return. I mean, what a man of faith. He just had such a faith that if it took... If, Abraham, if Isaac was absolutely offered and made into ashes, that God was powerful enough to, to resurrect him from the dead, from the very ashes, if that's what it meant, because God had promised Abraham, not just once but multiple times, that in Isaac was it all going to happen. And so what a huge test for Abraham. What a huge test. Reading on verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac at this stage did not know 
that he was to be the offering. He's just going with dad, obeying dad. Got the wood, got the fire, got the knife. Yes, we're up the mountain. Where's the lamb? <laughs> Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Not only was Abraham believing God for the sit in the situation, but he was actually prophesying of Jesus being the Lamb of God who was to come. And Abraham is a type of God the Father, and Isaac is a type of Jesus, who is the only begotten Son of Father God. You can see the similarity there. Verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abram built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. I mean, what a heart in Isaac even to allow his father to put him on the altar, to bind him up. I mean, he was so willing. I'm not even quite sure why he was bound, but you know, to allow himself, but he, he must have had just such confidence that what his father had said, it was going to be all right somehow. And so Isaac in faith allowed this all to go and to go, went along with all of this as well. Absolutely amazing. Verse 10, and Abram stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So here's the knife. It's just about. He's just about. And the angel of the Lord counted, called out of him in heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. What a huge test to offer your own son. Abraham's reverential fear for God was so strong and his faith towards God was so strong that he was able to make that choice. As much as he loved his son, he was able to make that choice. And verse 13, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So Abraham's on Mount Moriah, and yet God caused a ram to be there at exactly the same time. <sighs> you know, like it took them three days, and yet to get to this mountain, to get to this special place, and yet God... He's always working behind the scenes. We don't see things. And he's got the ram coming up the other side of the mountain to the very same place, to the very same place at the very same time. You know, the ram didn't stop halfway down the mountain. He got there at the very same time, the very same day. And Abraham saw him and the ram, he got caught in a thicket. His horns got caught in the thicket. And so he was stuck. He was in the right place. That ram was just there and it was God's provision for the whole situation. So sometimes we don't always know exactly how God's going to sort things out and do things in our lives or other people's lives. But God has it all covered. And if, our, if we will draw near to God and put our confidence and trust in God, it's going to be all right because we have his word on it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And verse 14 it says, And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh, as it is said to this day. And that Je Jehovah-Jireh means the Lord will provide. All right? It's called Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, but be because thou hast done this thing and has not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. How important is obedience? to God's word, obedience. And with obedience came blessing. We're not talking about a legalistic thing. We're talking about obedience. If God says to do this or do that, if we obey, 
And if, when we obey, there's blessing. And we know from this scripture that Abraham, he obeyed the Lord. He drew near to God and offered his best offering, his only promised son. Amen. And it says, I'll read in Romans 4, 16, that therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise that might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, like the Jews, but to also them which are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So Abraham is the father of all who believe, Jew or Gentile. All who believe, Abraham's the father. And as believers, we are the spiritual seed of Abraham. The natural seed are as the sand of seed, all the Jews, but those we've been grafted into the vine as spiritual seed into that vine. So we're the spiritual seed of Abraham. Hallelujah. And for us, just like Abraham, are we willing to obey the Lord, you know, draw near to the Lord and offer our best to the Lord? Isaac was Abraham's best. And God knows when he asks us for our best, what a sacrifice it is. He knows what he's asking for. But if we'll obey, if we'll do what he asks us for, he'll bring the blessing. He'll bring the provision. He'll do the rest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Next person I want to look at, the woman with the two mites. Let's turn to Mark chapter 12. Verse 41 to 44. And it says, And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and behold, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a, a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which made a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow, which has has cast more in than they all which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had and all of her living. Another same example elsewhere in the gospel said that it'll be a memorial to her. She, her that what she did will be spoken of every time the gospel is preached. And so what a, you know, what a woman, what a heart for God. And so this woman wasn't just a widow. I mean, as if that wasn't bad enough, having lost her husband. Rather, this widow, this, she was a poor widow. So, you know, she was really in quite a tough situation. And this woman, you know, she could have stayed at home that day. You know, certainly she didn't have much money to give into the offering. And however, but in her heart, she desired to draw near to God. And to be in church. And so she brought her best offering and gave it to the Lord. Put it into the treasury. Hallelujah. You know, and Jesus oversees everything, even today. And Jesus, just like he saw that widow, Jesus, he sees everything we put into, into God's kingdom work. And, and he sees, he looks on our heart to see if we're willing. It's not just a matter of giving, but the willingness in our heart. You know, are we really willing to give it with from our heart. Amen. Not begrudgingly, but out of willingness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, but she had a heart to do what she thought God wanted her to do. And she was obedient to that. And the scripture says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's in Luke 12, 34. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So whatever is the treasure of our heart, that's what we're going to give our most time to. That's what we're going to be involved with. That's what we're going to be uh, spending our money on. That's what we're going to give place to in our life. Wherever our treasure is, that's where our heart's going to be. And so we need to have a heart for God. That treasure needs to be for God, his word, and the gospel. Hallelujah. Our treasure needs to be him. He's the treasure. <laughs> he and his, his world, his kingdom, the treasure, and his word. Hallelujah. All right, now I'd just like to look at uh, Martha and Mary. You know, there's a passage in the Bible, a day when Jesus visited the house of Martha and Mary. Let's turn to Luke chapter 10. Verse 
numbers starting 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a this is Jesus entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus feet and heard his word but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him came to Jesus and said Lord dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone bid her therefore that she come and help me Verse 41, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. I'll read it quickly from the Amplified. It says, now while they were on their way, it occurred that Jesus entered a certain village and a woman named Martha received and welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary who seated herself at the Lord's feet and was listening to his teaching. But Martha, overly occupied and too busy, was distracted with much serving. And she came up to him and said, Lord, is it nothing to you that my sister has left me to serve alone? Like she's putting her case to him. Tell her, and here she is telling Jesus what to do. Tell her to then come and help me to lend a hand and do her part along with me. Verse 41. But the Lord replied to her, Jesus said to her saying, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. There is need of only one or but for a few things. Mary has chosen the good portion, that which is to her advantage, which shall not be taken away from her. So we can understand this passage naturally. You know, Martha has Jesus and his ministry team coming to visit her house. And as custom has it, you know, of course you get the food and beverages out for your visitors. And, uh, and there's a lot to get ready and set it all up and put the table out and put the food out. So in the natural, there's a lot to do. And even so, Martha's complaining to Jesus that Mary, her sister, is not helping her. Like, Mary over there, she's not helping me. And Lord, you should tell her and you should, you know, like point the finger. And, um, but, you know, what's Mary doing? Mary's listening to Jesus speaking. Mary's up close to Jesus. Martha then goes on to tell Jesus that she has to get everything ready by herself and even request Jesus to rebuke Mary and tell her to come and help her. But what Martha had not fully realized was that previous to Jesus visiting her house, he'd already fed the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fishes. So getting a meal to ready, getting a meal ready or feeding a number of guests is no problem to Jesus. No problem at all. And so it wasn't going to be difficult for him to have a meal prepared. You know, but the, the outcome of the story was Jesus commended Mary for putting him first. Even explaining that it was to her advantage. Saying that Mary had chosen the good part. And so Jesus encouraged Martha that she really only needed to be concerned with what he was saying just like her sister was. Hallelujah. You know, and spiritually, this passage, you know, that can speak volumes to us. And if we have a Martha heart, we will, of course, welcome Jesus into our house. Of course we will. And into our heart, into our life. Then as we walk our Christian walk, we may get very busy in life, uh, even in kingdom work, and think everything is resting on our shoulders. But, you know, and we may even complain to the Lord about the challenges around us. We shouldn't, but we might. However, if we have a merry heart, we've welcomed Jesus into the house and our heart and our life. And knowing and hearing from Jesus then becomes the most important thing in our life. Hearing from Jesus. And we will be sure to be sitting in heavenly places at his feet doing that first before anything else. Amen. We turn to Colossians chapter 3. So Mary chose the first, the best thing. Mary. 
you know, and uh, for us, we're either toiling or resting. Uh, Martha was like toiling and Mary was resting at Jesus' feet. And Colossians 3 verse 1, it says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God and set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. That's what Ma Mary was doing that day. She just got hold of Jesus and just said, I just want to sit with him, be with him, love him, get to know him, be where he is. She just put her heart on God. Hallelujah. And the Amplified says, If you then have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your minds and keep them set on what is above, the higher things, not on the things that are on the earth. You know, all these things that we see on the earth, they're only temporal. Yes, they're to, our, to, help, to be helpful aids to us, but we mustn't put our whole affection on them because they're just going to burn, especially when Jesus comes back or a, a tornado or a fire or a flood or they're just going to rust away. You know, we've just got to keep things in perspective. And some people get so upset over their possessions. It's, it, and we are to be good stewards of the possessions God gives us. But keep things in balance because they're only temporal. It's people that are eternal. Hallelujah. You know, and when we sit at Jesus' feet like Mary did, when we're up close to Jesus, we see him bigger because he's right there. But if we're a long way from Jesus, if we've strayed a little bit or drawn back, then Jesus is a lot smaller regarding any particular situation. So we need to be up close and personal with Jesus. And so we're right there with him. And, and because when we see him so big, magnifying him, well, all, all things are possible. Hallelujah. All things are possible. And so when we just put him first and continue to seek him, you know, draw near to him, and just continue to give into his work. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Toiling or resting. Toiling or resting. Isaiah 40 verses 28 to 31. And it says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary there is no searching of his understanding he gives power to the faint and to them that have no might he increases strength even the youth may f shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fail but they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint and i'm going to read that out of the amplified have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the, earth, of the ends of the earth, does not faint or grow weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint and weary, and to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply and making it to abound. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and selected young men shall feebly stumble and fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for and hope in him shall change and renew their strength and power and they shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint or become tired. I mean, what a wonderful scripture. When we put him first, when we go to him first, he wants to strengthen us, equip us, enable us, empower us for the day ahead. Hallelujah. So, you know, may our hearts be attuned to Mary's heart, that she just had a heart after God. Hallelujah. And I want to look at another lady, uh, the woman with an alabaster box, Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. starting in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired Jesus that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, 
when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. You know, this woman had such a soft heart. And she was broken and weeping before Jesus. Probably just his presence, so overwhelming. And, and even kissing his feet. And to kiss Jesus' feet, she certainly humbled herself. And she drew near to Jesus. And I don't know if you've experienced that, but in his presence sometimes we just weep because he's just who he is. And, you know, in that in that perspective he is so enormous and we are so minute in comparison and and sometimes you know i find that i'm be weeping in his presence because his presence is overwhelming sometimes and he's just so beautiful he's so wonderful hallelujah and just reading on verse 39 now when the pharisee which had bidden him saw it he spake within himself he spoke within himself listen to this saying this man if he were a prophet would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Now he said it within himself, and verse 40, and Jesus answering said to him, so Jesus even knew what the Pharisee was thinking. So you cannot hide anything from God. You might put on a nice face, but God knows what's going on on the inside. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? All right, so one owed him 500 pence and the other one owned, he, owned him 50 pence. All right, and Simon, verse 43, says, answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in has not ceased to kiss my feet. 46. My head with oil, Thou didst not anoint, but this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. All right. You know, this woman, yes, her life, whatever it was, but who did she come to? She came to Jesus and God saw her heart and also God saw the demonstration of her love for him and what she gave just out of her heart and, and weeping and wiping his feet with, his, with, her, with her hair. Like just what a heart and amazing. You know, and for us, you know, we will never be able to repay what Jesus, Jesus dying on the cross for us. You know, however, we are able to offer him our lives. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 22. And it says, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an even, evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. And the Amplified says, Let us come forward and draw near with true, honest and sincere hearts in unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith by that leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in his power 
wisdom and goodness, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty, evil conscience and our bodies cleansed with pure water. Hallelujah. And I mentioned earlier, didn't I, about Hebrews 12 verse 4. While we're here, we'll turn to it. Hebrews 12 verse 14. And it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then just turn over to James chapter 4, verse 8. And it says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The Amplified says, Come close to God, and he will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners. Get your soiled hands clean. Realize that you have been disloyal, wavering individuals with divided interests and purify your hearts of your spiritual adultery. All right. So spiritual adultery, you know, you may not we may not be committing natural adultery, but we can be committing spiritual adultery when we join ourselves to other things more important than God. We're putting other things like, you know, idols or whatever it is before God. And, you know, we do live in this world. We've got to keep balance. But, you know, Mary is the example that we'd have a, a, you know, she just wanted Jesus. And when we put him first, everything else works out. It just, um, it all just comes together. And so, you know, what is the cost of drawing near to God? What's the cost? The cost to drawing near to God is our self-life, our ways, our thoughts, and so on. It's us. That's the cost. So what's our best offering that we could give to God? Ourself. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 12. You know, we've learned in this session that Abraham offered Isaac and the woman had the alabaster box and Mary was at Jesus' feet. You know, it, that all took time. That all cost, you know. So what's our best offering that we could give God? It's ourself. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And the Amplified says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent servants and spiritual worship. You know, may we never forget our former life and where the Lord has brought us from. I know it's behind us, but we've got just must remember it w that was our old life, and we are a new creation. So, more importantly, even though that was our old life, more importantly, let's embrace our future in the Lord. And as we draw near to him each day, it's a daily thing. I offer myself daily as a living sacrifice, daily. And, uh, and so in summary, you know, now is the time to draw near to God and to offer ourselves afresh to God. And everyone said, Amen.